I tell people, look, I went through four years of that, um, and I got beaten, and I got used in child pornography, and I got all kinds of things that happened to me, but that is not the end of my story. And if it happened to you or somebody you know, that's not the end of yours either or theirs. I know that. You know, I've, I personally walk with people through their healing, and I know that it can change, but sometimes when you're in that place, you've never told anyone, it's so scary, and you didn't tell anyone for decades. Why keep it a secret? I, I was believing lies of the enemy. I was afraid if the world knew what had happened to me, if people knew that, that they wouldn't want me around, that I was somehow corrupted by things. And I, even worse, because it happened so young, I, I believed it was my fault, mm. which is a, a common thing. So among. common. And, and it's really not. As my counselor told me, a child can never consent, they can only comply. So tell me a little bit about what happened to you, just a little bit. You know, trafficking happens in many different ways. I can tell you I remember somewhere around seven different individuals who were frequent, you know, frequently get me over that period of four years. And, uh, and it all started with that one who was able to get me away from the public view. And they, you know, I only remember the one time with him alone. Um, and then after that, it was always two to four at one time. And they would hit me and use me in the pornography at one point when I was seven, uh, which in itself is an amazing thing because God restored my image. He said, I'm giving you back your picture. Yeah, even for you to be here today on camera mm -hmm. is a sign of your healing because that, that would have triggered you in the past to be on camera. Yeah, and I'm perfectly comfortable. Talk about the piece of without understanding because I'm, I'm sitting here looking at you um, outside of my own country, outside of my own home, outside of my own comfort zone, and yet I'm perfectly com comfortable because God is with us everywhere we go. He has restored my picture and he's restored my voice. And he says, you take that hope and you share it. And that's what I get to do. Your relationship with God, you, he had a role even in those early days. You cried out to him. Tell me a little bit about that moment when you were nine. Yeah, the last time it happened that I recall, I was back at my house. I was hiding in a closet and I was crying. And, and I remember saying, Father, help me. And instantly I had this, this sense I couldn't even cry anymore. It's like, this is, he took away the tears. And he took away the hurt in that moment. And it would be years before I was finally sort of brought out of that process. But in that moment, that hurt stopped instantly. And for years, I figured that's where the story ended in the blessing, as if that wasn't enough of a blessing. But I, I put the pieces together a couple of years ago. Two weeks after I said that prayer, we moved away from that town. And they never got me again. The abuse ended. That's and that is an encounter with the Spirit. That's why I cry at moments like this. Because, man, if that wasn't the hand of God at work in the life of a nine-year-old, I don't know what was. That's the God we serve, man. He is a protector yeah. of the innocent, and he rushes to our help when we cry out to him. Yeah. There is more to your story. We are going to dig into that. You know, I've always been a big believer that pursuing healing is not just a gift we give ourselves, but also everyone around us. Sean is such a great example of that. In just a moment, we're going to talk about how his healing has impacted others. You're not going to believe this. Particularly men can get convicted of sexu sexually abusing little boys. You explained how God intervened when you were nine, but really it wasn't until years later in 2011 that you really started diving into counseling. Tell me about that journey of healing. That happened, I had lost a job and the enemy had come around and said, you should have died when you were 18 because you're really not good for anything anymore. And, and that old sort of sense started coming back and, and I had nothing left to hold on to. I think I was at finally at a point where I was ready for God to work with. And he led me to hear a counselor in a church. Um, and I went and talked to her afterwards and she looked at me and said, when were you abused? And I can see it in your eyes. So she led me into prayer. And, you know, I think I just got tired of remembering my life as defined by something that was evil. And so the Holy Spirit came along and said, I got something better. Come home. I said, I don't know the way. 
He said, take my hand, I do. And so I did. You had something happen in counseling that was like really incredibly freeing. Tell me about that because it was a big step forward. Allison, my counselor, had asked me, she said, why did it take you so long? And I told her, I said, um, because if God had known where I was and what I'd done and what I'd let people do to me, he wouldn't want me, love me, or forgive me. <laughs> and she said, I'll let you in on a secret that really isn't much of one. He already knows. And it was like this light switch went off and this powerful sense of truth came in. It's like, he does know. He whispered and invented the sun. He knows all that. <laughs> so I re but see, I believed that since I was a little kid because that's what I'd been told. If God knew where you were, he wouldn't want you. Because you owned it like it was your fault. Yeah, I did. Tell me what freedom feels like now. Oh, yeah, well, a, an amazing difference and a transforming difference. You talk about redemption. Um, I, for years, had heard that God can make people new, and I said, that'll never happen to me, and I get it now. He makes us new. The fact that I can sit here comfortably and talk about that, um, that is purpose. I've heard Christians say, what is my purpose? Your purpose is to glorify God. And this is the one way that I'll be able to do it, offer the hope that he gave me to others. And you do that not only to other people who've been abused. You have over 400 people who've come to you and said, this happened to me, mm -hmm. that are coming out of darkness into the light, but, but literally to people who've done the abuse. Tell me about going to prison, okay? This is blowing my mind and ministering <laughs> to pedophiles. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I felt led by the Spirit, and I had promised him I would go where he told me to go. And he said, I want you to go to the prisons, and I want you to talk to the offenders. And I argued a little bit at first and yes. you know and then I said okay I promised and so I went there I thought I don't know how this is going to work but you're telling me to do it it'll do it well then I had a man come up to me and one of the very first times I spoke and he had been in prison for child pornography and he said I've, I've just gotten out and and how can a man like you forgive a man like me and I said because he forgives me we complicate it. God forgives me, and I'm required to forgive you. And I do so joyously because in doing that, I discovered that it's real. And he starts to tear up, and I start to tear up. And I said, look, as somebody who was on the other side of that camera, I release you. Now you take it to the cross, and you find that freedom and that forgiveness, and you can see this weight fall off of this man. And he's found his way back into society. And he's found freedom and hope. And, you know, the Bible says when we speak, we're to speak as the oracles of God. Jesus says, you forgive people. So I do, and I will. That's how I know that what happened in you is real. Because if you can sit across from an abuser, and if you can speak words of love and forgiveness, that means that there is something happening that's beyond humanity. That yeah. that is a spiritual thing.